Hey everybody, it's not time yet. We are going officially live in less than five minutes. However, my objective is always to make sure things are working properly. So um, I'm secretly here and some of you may be here early as well, so welcome. But I will do an official welcome and say more about today's show and all of that good stuff um, as soon as as soon as soon noon happens. So uh, I have this fabulous, he's not so new anymore, but he's still new to some of you. I have a fantastic new um, director. His name is Johnny Roman, who started being the director last year. So he and I are making sure that everything is working properly. And, you know, as usual, uh, Facebook allows for some new developments every time we do this. So uh, we're trying out some stuff and you don't even know it. You don't even see it. So um, we're seeing if Johnny can have a different kind of official role in the Facebook Live that makes him look even more important than he already is. We will see if that occurs or not. Um, let me know in comments if you're watching this. We want to make sure if you're here already that you can hear me and you can see me. Um, and uh, there you go. So I'm excited about today. Uh, for those of you who are not following me on CFJ Coaching on Instagram. I'm excited because you'll see I'm a big Lizzo fan. For those of you that haven't figured it out yet, the name of today's show is Lizzo's Song. It's about damn time. So I'm excited. So this is like just a tiny little preview um, before we hit noon. And um, just we're, we're just seeing, oh, perfect. Diana, thank you. So you can see Daniel Allen. Excellent. Glad you both are here and here a little bit early. That's good. Um, Johnny, I don't know. It seems like our attempt at the other thing is not working, but I know you and I are both going to be watching the comments. So even though you can't see him, Johnny is here. He is here with us and he is helping because he's going to help me track questions and track comments and make sure all your questions get answered. So he is here with us. He will pop onto the comments for you. And um, we're going to get going in less than two minutes. Um, I hope everyone is having a beautiful day. It is almost 12 noon Pacific here in Los Angeles. Um, Emrita, glad you're here. Melissa Ward, always good to have you. Uh, welcome. And um, it's three o'clock on the East Coast where some of my favorite people are and uh, including my husband at the moment. So, you know, we're, we're spread out all over the country currently doing all sorts of service, which is so great because today's theme is it's about damn time to serve versus sell. Now, of course, service is always the foundation from which, at least for me, how, how I do my work, how I built my practice, it never goes away, but we're gonna drill down on service today in some important ways that help you. The number one job of today is to help you keep growing your practice. If you're brand new, let's get you some brand new clients. If you already have clients, let's get you stronger today. So that is the objective. Now we have less than 30 seconds to the official beginning. Um, what can I say as we count down the moments until it's officially, it's about damn time. See, it's about damn time. So I have to wait till the exact time to start. And we're gonna do that in less than 10 seconds. Um, if you're here, I want you to know that questions are going to be part of this. So if you have questions that you want to ask about what's happening in your world, you're going to post those in the comments. Johnny's going to alert me if I don't see it, and I'm going to answer them. So it's 12 o'clock in Los Angeles. Let's do this. It's about damn time to serve versus sell. My name is Carolyn Freyer-Jones. I am a professional coach and facilitator. 
I also run the CFJ Coaching Success School, of which we already have some people who've been in the school and are coming back next year, like Diana Towder. So happy you're here. And um, I'm here to talk about service as a component in our practice, really as the component. So we're here to take a deep dive on what service really means as we build and grow a coaching business. And I've been thinking a lot about that as we approach today. So first of all, we got to give Lizzo some cred, right? It's about damn time. Obviously, I love the song. I took the title. I loved the idea of it's about damn time to serve versus sell. I tried to get Steve Chandler to walk into the song It's About Damn Time when he taught at my school last year for his live day. He didn't want to. He felt like it really wasn't his vibe. So I get it. You know, that's not his scene, but I love her and I love what she stands for. I love her level of a creative expression. There's so much I love about her. And I also love that she has a spirit of service. So it works really well for today. So let's talk. Here's what I want to say. Most coaches, including me at the beginning, had no idea. I really didn't understand service in the context of professional coaching. I just didn't. You know, I came from the University of Santa Monica where I earned my master's in spiritual psychology. And and that's really where I learned about service and being of service to others. That's a component of the education that you learn. I had no idea. Like, I'm from New York. My family, I mean, my dad did a lot of service without me really knowing, but we didn't talk about service as a family. We didn't grow up with a culture of service. So when I attended the University of Santa Monica, my first exposure to service were the assistants that stood in the back. Now, I didn't know this at the time, but they took their own time to come and assist the entire class weekend which was an enormous amount of hours. They were grads or they were a year ahead and they did it because they wanted to serve the new students. Now I was from New York. When I found out that they were doing that and they weren't getting paid, do you wanna know what my reaction was? My private judgmental reaction? So my private judgmental reaction was this. Losers, losers. Why would people do that? What are you talking about service? That's nuts. That is nuts, those people in the back. Now, fast forward two plus years, I'm one of those people in the back. And I'm much, I'm I'm really understanding the joy of service, right? Which is really about the joy of giving and the joy of helping, right? Now, I'm going to say this for everyone. Steve Chandler once said this, and I laughed so hard. He was like, hey, if selling worked, I'd sell. It just doesn't work. So I serve. We want to be clear, like when we're growing something and we want to bring people into our sphere, we all have such a high radar for sales. And I say that there's nothing wrong with selling. I want to be clear about that. But we have such a radar and such like a stay away from me based on the onslaught that we have now in our world with, you know, people calling on our phone and people showing up in our email so that we're so sensitive that anything that smacks of I want something from you makes people go, ugh, I don't like that person. It just does. So we're in a relationship building business. Jenna, oh my gosh, it's so fun to see you. It's about damn time. Claire Marie, fabulous. Angela, glad you're here. Um, So we want to slow down on, because sometimes coaches think, oh, I have to be of service. Like that's a technique. And it's not. It's really about giving of yourself and helping, right? So I'm going to give a story to help um, highlight what I mean by this it was early in my practice. Um, maybe I was a little bit in, I was maybe two years in and I was coaching a young woman. She was no longer my client, but I coached her for a while and I loved her. She was super fun to coach. And she was in relationship with someone that I also knew personally. And she reached out to me after we'd completed coaching. And she said to me, 
um, I'm breaking up with so-and-so and I want you to know. And I said, okay, I'm glad you're telling me. And of course I was like, how are you doing? She's like, I'm fine, but he's not going to be okay. And I wanted you to be aware with, of it because I know you're connected to him. And I said, okay, great. I appreciate you letting me know. And I go to Steve and I'm like, what do I, like, how do I handle this? Like, I know that her boyfriend is in therapy, right? I know that he has support in his life. And Steve was like, what are you doing? Reach out to him. Tell him that you know, I mean, Steve was joking. Tell him you know that he got dumped and you want to help him. And I had so much like, oh, is that okay? Like, it's so personal. He's like, he's in the midst of this breakup. And, and I was also like, he's got a therapist, which, you know, nothing against therapy. Therapy is fabulous. I've utilized therapists at very key times in my life. It's different. And Steve said, no, no, you can help him in different ways. Reach out to him. And I realized that what was getting in my way was this like false kind of like sensitive, not wanting to embarrass him. And Steve said to me, but how are you going to help him if you don't let him know what you know what's going on, Carolyn? And I just thought, okay, I'm going to do this. And I sent him an email and I said, hey, I heard from so-and-so that you guys are splitting up. I'm guessing that might be a big deal for you. Let me know if you want to have a conversation just because, you know, I, I know you. And I just shared with him how much I admired him, how much I appreciated who he was. He was part of a community that I was also in. And I just acknowledged him. And he wrote back and he said, can we talk? Because he was in rough shape. This was a big breakup. This was someone, a woman that he thought, you know, he was potentially going to spend the rest of his life with. And so we talked. Now, I want to slow this down. This was a relationship of someone I already knew, right? I was in a community with him. So I knew that, like, this was not a stranger to me. And that's really important. And he wasn't a stranger. So it made it easier for him to say, yes, I'd like to have a conversation, right? He knew me. He knew I was a coach. So all those things were in place. So that's a really important factor here. That's an example of, I already knew someone. I knew something big had occurred in their lives and I reached out. Now, lots of you know people already who have big things occurring in their lives, right? Now, this was an example of a breakup. Other times it's loss, right? Like someone loses someone important to them. Sometimes it's a new job. Sometimes it's um, a baby. Sometimes it's a move, right? And we hesitate to think we could help them. Like I could help them. I've been through a huge move. I've been through lots of loss, right? Like we hesitate, like, ooh, I don't, what will they think? I don't know. And I want to really be a voice for dare to offer. So I'm going to repeat that. Dare to offer your time, your presence, even if it's just an email that's like, hey, I know you just had this big new job thing happen. That is so exciting. You're the best person for it. I can't imagine anyone else in that role. And I just want you to know I'm thinking about you. And after the dust settles, right, because I know you're in the like startup phase of that job, if you want to connect, like we could do that and talk about how you're going to knock that ball out of the park at that job if that would be helpful and totally fine if no either way I just want you to know like I'm so excited for you right so we want to start with the world that we're in right we're not starting with strangers we're not starting with um you know people that are we barely know we want to look in our intimate world right so I was speaking with someone yesterday a newer coach and um Hey, Michael, good to see you. Sachiko, nice to see you. Um, I'm going to challenge you, right? This is one of the challenges Steve would give me when I was in a phase of like, I don't have anybody to serve. I have nobody. He would be like, go through your last 40 emails that you received. Go into your trash folder and look at 40 emails that you've received. I can guarantee you there are people in there that you could serve. I can guarantee it. So many of us, 
Now I'm going to say this to you and I want you to put in the comments, are you going to do this? Because most of us as coaches go, oh, but I already looked or there's nobody there and we don't do it. We convince ourselves immediately that it's a bad idea. Okay. So I want to know in the comments, will you do this in the next 24 hours? Will you actually go through your last 40 emails? So if you will put in the comments, yes. So then Johnny can see, did they, who is it? Who said they would? And we want to know how it went, right? So um, Linda, good to see you. I see you posing as Ed again. I like that you have a front now, that Ed is your front. Um, so I'm going to open it up to some questions, but I have another area that I want to talk about service about, right? So you can post your questions because like I said, Johnny is going to alert me when they're there. And I want to give you a heads up about this. We have something for people who are super serious. Well, let me say it differently. Who are really sincere about getting into more service in their practice, right? So we have something. And the way to get that, I'm going to share at the end of the Facebook Live. But I want you to know, like, it's, it's something new. Nobody has seen it before. Nobody in last year's school has received this yet. It's a new document. I think it's really, really good. It's not an easy document to read. Even for me, when I read it, I thought I would have had sweat if I had read this in my first two to five years of my practice. I think Johnny, when I gave it to him to look at, he was like, uh, that made me uncomfortable too. And Johnny's a couple years into his practice and is doing great. So we'll, we'll talk a little more about that. But I want to talk about this idea because this comes up a lot with coaches like, well, how much do I serve? Right. Because, you know, coaches sometimes are given away lots and lots of their time. And I want to say if you're at the beginning, meaning like new, less than maybe you only have one client, maybe you have two clients. That's part of the experience, right? Like part of it is like, learning to discern when I'm giving too much, you know, my guideline, my rough guideline is three conversations, three meaningful, depthful conversations where you serve someone tends to be my limit. Now I want to be straight up though. I've made exceptions to that lots and lots, especially at the beginning. Right. And one of the things I want to talk about is that's not the only way to serve. So often coaches are like, you want to talk? I'll talk to you. And that can be wonderful, but it can also feel like too much too soon. So, um, two to five years, is it still new? Um, I would say you're in the inter in, you're in a middle phase. All right. Two to five years. And some of it depends on where your practice is. So two to five years can be new if you haven't yet gotten your practice up and running in a way that really works. So that depends. So if you want, Barb, put in your comment, like, is your practice full? Are you, are, are you, are your fees where you want them to be? Are, are you able to convert conversations into clients? Some of that new is not always a, a measure of the time we've been a coach. Sometimes it's a measure of how are our results? Cause I know people who really, were new at four years because they hadn't yet learned how to really do this. So their practice still looked really new, even though they'd been doing it for four years. So service can be many things. One of them can be sending people things, right? And I mean that, like people go, what are you talking about? And I like, you don't need to have money to send people things, especially now. I mean, there's, videos and articles and just you can do so much research and really send someone something that's thoughtful that's valuable um you know i have someone like obviously i think many people know and if you're new to this if you don't know both of my parents died in the last two and a half years so both of my parents died that was very new territory for me um my dad died it kind of in the first year of the pandemic, he did get COVID at a hospital and he, he passed away very quickly. My mom passed away a year and two days later. So that put me in this new territory in my life called living without my parents, which has been both 
new and uncomfortable and amazing in some ways, especially because my parents were, you know, they weren't the easiest of the bunch. Um, what it did for me though, as a coach is I had this whole new way that I could make a difference, right? Because I had people um, who came after me who lost parents. Like my understanding of that experience deepened profoundly after that. So now I'm willing to talk to anyone who's walking through that. And I don't care about them becoming my client. And that's not just because I have money in the bank. It's like, I wanna do that in the world. So I was just up in Maine with my husband and we were at a place having some dinner and I, 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 got, I got introduced to some people. They have no idea that I'm a coach. They don't care. And they were sharing about something going on in their lives with one of their parents. And I said, you know, I've been through that. If it would be helpful, we can connect about that, right? So I'm not in the game of service to get. So I'm gonna say that again. I'm not in the game of service to get. And some of you are in the game of service to get, right? There's a get, like I wanna get this person. I wanna get something. And I understand the confusion. Like, well, Carolyn, I'm here to build a practice. Um, so how, I don't understand. And I'm gonna say something that Steve Chandler said to me and says still, it's like, if you are of enough service in the world, sooner or later, someone's gonna go, how, how do I get more time with you? How do I spend time with you? How, how do I do that, right? I'm gonna give you another story. I was talking to someone as a potential client, this was a couple of years ago, and we had a good conversation. I don't think she was blown away by my coaching. I mean, it was a good conversation, corporate executive, we talked a couple times, you know, she was, she, it, you know, I was like, I, even I felt it. I was like, mm, what's here? And then I don't even know how I found out. She maybe wrote to me. We, maybe we had another conversation scheduled and she said, I need to move it. I have to go deal with this medical thing. And I wrote back and I was like, well, what is it? Do you mind sharing? And it was a health scare. It was like this thing that they thought could be cancerous. And I said to her, well, would, if it would be helpful, do you want to talk before that appointment? Would it be helpful? And she said, yeah, that would be really helpful. I moved some stuff on my calendar and I got on the phone with her. Now, all I was like, I was like, how can I help her prepare for this appointment and prepare for the news either way, right? Because what I knew that I would say to her that would be different from what other people who are close to her would say is that they would... They're not, they're like, it's going to be fine. It's not going to be cancer. You're going to be fine. And my conversation was like, let's talk about the answers you might get and how it might impact you. If the answer is there's a cancer diagnosis. Like I didn't pretend that that didn't exist. And I didn't pretend that it might, it would, it, that's this out of the realm of possibility. And I said to her, now look, we're going to hold the vision, right? That this is a blip and it's nothing. But, but I don't want you sitting in a room with a doctor and they go, um, we need to tell you that there's a cancer diagnosis and you have no thought, you, it's like it, it hasn't even entered your mind. She was so grateful, right? So that moved the needle for her in such a way that a week later she wrote to me and she was like, I'm clear, I wanna work with you. Now at that point I was like, it didn't matter anymore. So some of this has to be about putting outside the room that you're in when you're writing to people and connecting with people that anything matters. That service is pure service, right? So I'm gonna take a, a moment. I wanna make sure um, I'm looking at the comments just to see if there's a question that I can get to. Johnny, for some reason I am having, all right, let me, So Barb, I see, I understand when you say that about new being, how developed is your skill and practice? Okay. So maybe Barb, you can tell us like, where are you? Like, are you, how, how, for, how far along are you in your own um, development as a coach? Um, so I'm looking at yours, Linda. I recently had a familiar person say he was going to need me soon. 
I've been hesitant to offer to familiar people. All right, so Linda, you, do, you, you don't want to be hesitant with familiar people. Familiar people are your people, right? They are the ones that you want to serve and go. It's like you want to become someone who's a trusted source of service in their world, right? Who will serve no matter what. You want to become someone like that. And familiar people are the place to start. You have familiar people, which is more than some coaches have, right? And the context is, I might be able to help you. So that's something I want to slow down on. Because often in this world of coaching, right, there's a lot of, of let's say, I'm going to use a word, like braggadocious it can feel. Like, I can help you. I know I can help you. And I'm going to put the pause button on that because we don't really know until we connect with someone. And I don't want to make assumptions that I can help anyone. I always, my language is always, I, maybe I can help you. If we talk, let's see. And I do that all the time, even though I've been coaching for over 15 years, even though I've done lots of coaching, it doesn't mean I can help every coach. It doesn't mean I can help every person. So I want to invite you into this possibility that you really don't know. You do not know if you can serve someone. However, you might be able to. You just might. And if you can come from that place of, I just might be able to help you. I don't know. We would need to have a conversation and maybe now's not the time. That, it's like when I say that, how does that feel? Does that feel like, oh, wow, that's a real gracious way of talking to me, right? I don't feel assaulted by Carolyn. I don't feel like she's like trying to chisel her way into my situation without permission, right? It's an offer. And I say, and I don't know if I can help. So I want to hear if that is helpful. And Linda, I want to see, are you going to get over the hesitation of offering to familiar people, right? Because familiar people are the way. It's like, if you're not doing that, that is a miss in the growth of your business, right? Because we have people all around us and you probably have coaches on this Facebook Live who are like, give me your familiar people. Unfortunately, they're not familiar to them. So Christy Weston is here. Hello, Christy Weston. Um, so let's do this. I'm going to ask you a question. I'm going to ask you a question. On a scale of 1 to 10, I want you to tell me how service-oriented are you? And I'm going to give a caveat, meaning if there's get in your serving, meaning I want to get something, the number goes from 10 down. 10 is like, I'm really able to be of pure service. I'm able to put my own wants and needs outside of the room and I'm able to really be like, I'm just here with this person. I'm going to see if I can help them. If there's get energy in your serving, your number goes down. So one is like, I'm all get. 10 is like, I can be of pure service. So I want to hear where are you in your ratings? So post them up and I'm going to take a look and we're going to talk about it. Seven, eight, Melissa, good. Who else? Christy, nine, that's great. Nine, nice. Seven, Allison. Gareth, eight, great. Great, Farnaz, eight, eight, lots of eights, okay. Eight, eight, Cynthia's like eight minus. Six, seven, six, okay. Nine, five, Daniel, way to go on the honesty. Right, so okay, so these are fantastic. I love, Melissa, that you said seven, eight, depending on my finances. Six, Diana, depends on my internal weather. Six to nine, nine, okay. So I'm gonna put a challenge to, the, to you. And I agree, it is dependent on convert, like the moment, right? If my, if I got to pay the mortgage and my bank account's low, ooh, 
I can really start to have less than an eight show up, right? So anything less than an eight, you can know the person is feeling it. And by that, I mean, it's leaking into the subtext of the conversation. It's leaking in energetically. It's just there. It's there. So, you know, we're human. It's okay. It's not like now you're bad and wrong because sometimes you have get leak into your service. Um, and you want to go, how am I getting my number up? And, and it's a valuable thing to look at right before a conversation. And I mean right before. So if I'm going to have an enrollment conversation, this was many years ago, it's like I would do an inventory. So you mentioned your internal weather, Diana. This is a fabulous thing to do. So I would do an inventory. I'd be like, where am I on it? Because sometimes I was really in get. Like there was somebody I really wanted to coach. I, of course, in my vast ego was like, I can help this person. They should work with me. And I would be in this space and I'd be like, ooh, this is not going to do it. I knew enough to know this was icky. And I'd be like, how am I going to put a sword right here, stake in the ground? That's like, I'm not be, I'm not going to be that person. I'm not going to make that person wrong, but I'm not going to be that person. And some of you may have heard me say this, but it bears repeating. Most of what Steve Chandler says bears repeating. And this is it. So if it's about money in the moment, right? It's like, I need money. I remember Steve Chandler would say this to Michelle and I, you may need money, but you don't need their money that person. Money's everywhere. You don't need that specific person's money. So that always helped me. I'd be like, all right, I don't need their money. I might need money, but I don't need theirs. And then the other thing that would help me a lot is like, look, this is one conversation. I may never ever talk to this person again. And the thing I want most is for them to leave this conversation feeling like it was helpful and that it did something for them. That's my number one job. If I can turn the mirror around from me to them and go, I want them to walk off that call being like, wow, that person made like, they, wow, they really were with me. Like they really helped me. That's my only job. And I can come back to being needy and in my get when the phone is hung up or the Zoom call is ended. So I'm going to challenge you if you're like, I'm a six, I'm a five to be like, okay, your job is to get that number up, right? You got to get that number up. Now, some of you, that may mean I got to get some other work so that I'm not anxious about money because nobody hires an anxious coach. I mean, if they do, they're not, they don't know you're anxious yet. So bravo, you're, you're keeping that under wraps, but we don't hire anxious coaches. We don't hire coaches where we're like, they're, they're having some money issues. Nobody wants to hire a coach who they can feel their money issues leaking into the conversation, right? So it is a practice of like, I'm going to be 100% dedicated to this person right now. And I'm not going to pretend like I know how to help them until I know if I can help them. And I'm not going to assume that what they're dealing with requires coaching. So that's another one. That's another subtle one that we do as coaches. Oh, um, that could really use coaching. It's like, maybe, maybe not. I'm going to coach you for this next 90 minutes. Is that okay with you? But I'm not going to say to you yet that what you're dealing with, that would benefit from coaching. I'm not going to do that yet, especially if they're brand new and they don't know me. I'm going to be like, nope, trust has not been built. Rapport has not been built. Slow down in building relationships. Slow down. It's really important. It can't be said enough that we need to go slower, especially in the beginning. When we're awkward and we're green. Michael, I think it was with you that I was saying, we're not going to, there's no hack for feeling awkward, clunky, and green. There's no hack for it. If I could give you a pill and go, great, you're never going to feel awkward, clunky, or green. I don't think I would even give it to you because I think it's so valuable but it's, we're not going to hack for that. So we want to use that. That's part of the process of becoming good at something, of becoming good. I was just reading an article about, um, and then we're going to go to this question from Barb, um, an article about Steve Martin and how he started in his comedy career. 
and I like murders in the building and I've always liked Steve Martin. And he said, I thought this was really like just this nugget. He said he was like working at some place near Knott's Berry Farm. And sometimes there were four people in the room. He goes, so that was my audience. But he said, I did it like five times a day over and over. He goes, but you know what that did for me? I got all the, um, I got all the like newbie stuff out. I got all the tentativeness out. I got all the like, I feel uncomfortable stuff out. Like that all went away. So no matter what, when I showed up in a room, even if my act was bad, I didn't sound like I'd never done it before. So just know that practice and doing stuff over and over again and trying new things and trying to say the same thing again is part of the journey. It is. So I want to go to your question, Barb. Sometimes when I invite someone in and service, I feel like I'm opportunistic in the asking. Like, can I maybe help? Do you need help? Um, I like that. I mean, I hear you. I, I, I appreciate that. Now, the question is when you say you're opportunistic, right? Oh, you mean like, oh, somebody just had this thing occur in their life and I'm coming in and saying, hey, I know this happened, if it would be helpful. You know, we have to be willing to risk offering. Whether or not how they receive it, we really can't control that. We can control the message we send. We can control where we're coming from inside. But we can't control, like, we're not um, ambulance chasers, right? That's not what this profession is, right? So when I reached out to the guy who just got broken up with, I felt I had a lot of, I had a lot of compassion for him. I was like, I knew he was in a rough spot based on what I knew about him. So I was like, if I can help him, I want to help him, right? So Barb, a question you have to ask yourself is, is it true that you're being opportunistic? Is that true? And I want you to tell us your answer. Is it true that you're being opportunistic? I'm guessing that your answer is no, but I don't want to, I don't want to assume. So ask yourself. And I encourage all of you to ask yourself, am I being opportunistic when I offer to someone who might be going through a challenging time? My answer is no. My answer is no. I want to help. I want to help people no matter what, whether I'm making money or I'm not making money. And I want to say that to you, Melissa Ward, because I know you have that consciousness, right? I know you want to help. So if you keep coming back to that, that you know you want to be of service, right? No matter what, no matter situation, circumstance, or environment, it's like that's where you want to come from. That's where you want to come from. So um, Allison, I'm commenting on in the desire to serve, how do we stop being too accommodating and too obliging and eager to please? Excellent question. I love that you asked that. So. I think just so you know, there should be like a, a someday, I'm not, I'm not committing to this yet, but like there should be like a, I want to make a game for coaches, like a board game, right? And it's going to be, um, it's kind of, I haven't decided yet what game it's going to be like, whether it's the game of life or Monopoly, but there's going to be like this island that you go to and it's the island of people pleasing and over accommodating, right? It's this island. And you have to pick a card and you have to get off the island. But the island is an island that we have all visited, Allison. We have all visited, right? So I want to first say, like, welcome to the island of over-accommodating and people-pleasing. If you've been to the island or you're on the island, give a yes. Let Allison know she is not alone if that's happening for you, right? So welcome to the island of people-pleasing and over-accommodating. Now, you're asking the question of, well, how do I know the line? Like, what's the line between serving and people pleasing? Okay. For me, Charles, I appreciate your question. I'm going to come to that. I love that. Um, the, the way I know that I'm in people pleasing is, and this is an inner experience, Allison. So, so we'll see if you can, this resonates for you. Like, I know I'm in people pleasing when inside of me, it's like, I want them to notice me. I want them to, I want them to like me. Like, I, and I know what that feels like, right? I know what it feels like when I want someone to like me. Uh, I felt it a lot from the ages of like 12 to, I don't know, 40. Um, all right, maybe 35. 
Um, so I know that. So there's a quality in my inner experience that feels like, oh, please, I, I hope this works. Um, yes, I'll do that. And it's like I've moved out of non-attachment. It's like I'm in the land on that island where I'm attached. I want them to like me. I want them to notice me. And it's an inner experience. So my first question for you, Allison, is are you aware what, of what people pleasing feels like and when you want to be liked? Do you know that? Because as soon as that's happening, it's like that's a great, it's like a feedback mechanism. And you can pull back from that island. You can be like, all right, I need to, um, the, Eric, to plane, to plane. Right. So we know. Right. Yes. I'm, I'm, oh, Allison, I'm a man, by the way, from birth. Okay. Thank you for clarifying that. Um, my bad. I apologize. I miss, I took the name. I made an assumption that the name was a woman's name. So I apologize, Allison. So, so you do, did you, did you answer the question like of, yes, you know what it feels like when you're people pleasing? I'm seeing if you're going to give us an answer. So if you do, and most of you have said yes, right? So there, that's, there's feedback right there. We all tend to know it, right? Sometimes we need a coach to go, I just looked at your communication. There's people pleasing in here. Like what's happening? It's like there's a leak that goes on on that island where it's in your language. And some of the language includes like, I'd be happy to. Um, it includes offering way more options of times to meet than just one or two. Like people pleasing includes um, sort of like there's there's like a desperation in the like wanting to make time for someone even though they're not they're not exactly responding at the level you would like them to. So I see you said yes. I guess I know in my inner knower, right? So if you know, now is the time to start going when that's occurring. What am I doing? Number one, what am I telling myself? Am I telling myself like I need this person on some level? Am I telling myself like this thing really matters to me? Like this conversation, this opportunity, this thing. See, when I'm in this matters to me, I got to like go, oh, on the island. I'm on the island of people pleasing. And I need to like look at my cards and go, high involvement, low attachment. I have to look at the cards and go, oh, I remember who I am. I remember that my whole world does not rely on this one person. It doesn't. And that is something all of us as coaches can really, we can get very myopic, right? When we, when we, when we have coached someone and we really, wow, they were amazing. I would love to coach them. We can get very myopic, like that person is the thing that is going to make me feel good when they become my client. When that's going on for me, I'm like, ooh, Carolyn, I need to take a walk. I need to look at some emails that help me remember who I am in, in my inside of me, that my intention is service, that I'm enough without, without this person. So the cards, what's the card that's going to wake you up to step back from people pleasing. What's your card that's gonna get you off your island of people pleasing, right? Because we need them. We need them. Um, all right, I'm gonna go to Charles's question. I'm gonna go back up. Okay, can you talk more about what slowing down when building a relationship specifically looks like in a coaching context? Charles, that's a great question. Here's what I'm gonna say. So slowing down means initially I'm not rushing to offer conversations, right? And, and let me give you a couple of examples of what that can look like. So let's say I'm going to reach out to someone who I met. Maybe I met someone in Maine when I was there. And I'm going to reach out to them, like the person who I know is going through something. And I'm going to be like, hey, it was so good to meet you in Maine because I happen to have their email address because... It's from a community my husband grew up in. So I'm like, hey, I, you know, I, and I want to send you something. You talked about this thing going on and I want to send you something. Would that be okay? And if yes, send me your address. So I'm not, if you hear me, Charles, I'm not like, let's talk or, and I'm not, and I'm not even saying a lot in the email. 
Like I'm just gentle, right? I might include how are you doing since we met? And I have something that I want to send to you if, you know, if it would be okay with you. So I might just put how are you doing? And then I'm going to do that. And then they're going to write back. Let's assume they write back. And they're going to be like, yeah, no, that would be great. Send me something. Here's my address. And I'll be like, okay, I'm going to send you a book. It'll be to you by in four days. And if it's okay with you, how about I'll just email you in like two weeks after you've at least started it. You know, tell me either way. So really gentle, right? I'm going to write to you in two weeks. And I'm just going to see. And so I'm going to write, I'm going to keep my word. I'm going to write in two weeks and I'll be like, Hey, have you started the book? I'm curious how it is for you. That's it. It's the only thing I'm asking. How is it for you? And they're going to go, hopefully, right? They're going to go like, Oh my gosh, I'm already on chapter four. Holy cow. This is an amazing book. It is so helpful based on what I'm going through. Thank you so much which is what often people write. But I'm going to ask another question, Charles. I'm going to be like, I'm curious, what are the two most helpful things you've read about so far? What are the two most helpful things you've read about so far? And let's say they write back and they're going to go this and this, and I'm going to say, great. And I'm going to say, so, hey, here's the thing. If you want, after you're done with the book, we could have a conversation where we talk more about all the takeaways in the book. And also I, you know, this thing that's going on for you, if you want, cause you know, this is, I talk about this stuff with people all the time. This is what I do and totally fine. If that doesn't line up for you. Now, Charles, for me, this is a relationship that I would define as social, right? I met them in a social context at a restaurant. This is not someone who came to know me, initially in my professional context, right? So that's an important distinction. If it's someone I've met socially or know socially, I'm going to go even slower because we're converting someone from a more social relationship into potentially a more professional one. So I'm going to be gentle. I'm not going to rush to offering a conversation. Um, does that help? I want to know, does that example handle showing you what slowing it down can look like? What slowing it down can look like? I mean, my point of view in all my work with coaches and in the school, most coaches are coming in way too hot. Come, and I did. So I'm not saying anything I didn't do. We're coming in way too hot. We're like jumping the gun. We're offering time too soon. We're like, you know, now the prosperous coach is such a, there's so much out there, right? And the book itself, people take it and they, without coaching, they're like, I'm going to do this. Right. And, and they, they still jump. They're still jumping the gun. They're moving way too fast. So we're coming in too hot and that's what's happening in the world, right? Like everybody's moving so fast. So to slow down can feel quite strange, right? Like I had a coach that I coached and I kept saying to her, you need to slow down. And she was meeting with me live for a session. She like curled in a ball on the floor. She was like, I can't go any slower. She was like, I can't. I don't even know what you mean, Carolyn. And if you don't know what I mean, then you know there's something to look at. Like, wow, what would it look like if I went 5% slower with people in my relationship building? What would that look like? Some of the things I see is that when coaches are sending communications, um, we're sending like people are sending like five questions, right? Like they ask them about this and then they ask them about that and they ask how that other thing's going. And um, it, like in the Facebook page of the school where we're constantly looking at communications from coaches, right? That's a big chunk of the school, right? For six to nine months, coaches are posting drafts and either I'm looking at them or a faculty member is looking at them. And we're like, that's a lot of questions in there. Why don't you bring it down to one or two? Like if I, if you sent me that, I'd be like, wow, too many questions, too many words. The other thing about questions, right? So Charles, think about this. Questions are personal, right? If we're like, how are you doing? It's a little broader. But if I'm like, how did it go with that job interview? I'm, I'm getting into someone's personal arena. And we want to be thinking about 
Would I feel good about that question at the stage of our relationship if I were them? How would that feel to me? Right? We want to tune into that. It's like, would that feel good to you? And then if you're like, I don't know if that would feel good to me. I mean, truthfully for me, you know, when I first met Steve and started, like, I, he didn't, it's like, he was so, um, he didn't ask a lot of questions up front. He listened a lot. He might have only asked me one or two questions when we first talked. Only one or two. Now, that opened big doors for me. I, I shared a lot. But he wasn't peppering me with questions and emails. And he wasn't peppering me with questions in, um, in, my, in my conversations with him. So I'm going to check, Charles. I think you said helps a great deal. Hearing to allow them to be in choice. Just, and just practice. Try it. Be like 5% slower. Maybe I'll just send one question in an email. Or maybe I'll just send one, hey, I was thinking about you today. How are you doing? I know you just started school, right? Um, I'm thinking of my own life where my daughter literally just started high school yesterday. So if someone was writing to me, right, they'd be like, hey, I know your daughter just started high school. How's it going? That would be plenty. If someone was like, is she having a tough time? How are you doing? Is it hard? Oh, that must be so emotional. I'd be like, oh, please step back from the questions. Just one, one or two. Um, all right, I'm going to Dara. Do you often offer to help and actually schedule time to coach someone initially without any expectation or request of payment? Is offering your services with strings attached and oh yeah, so Bravo, uh, Dara, great question. Yes, um, the, I, I'm never anticipating a payment when I offer time to someone, ever. Like that is not even a thought in my mind. Like, and if my mind starts to go to, ooh, maybe this person will become my client and then I can you know, pay off my credit card. I wanna be like, whoa, jumping out into the future and imagining their money coming to me and eh, do not pass go. You, there's going to be another island in the game. And the island in the game is going to be called jumping into your future and imagining someone as your client too soon. It's a long name for an island. Maybe someone will have a better one. But that island is not an island you want to spend time on, especially early in a relationship, right? So if I'm offering time to someone, I'm not thinking about money. I am not thinking about even if I have no idea. Like, there, I want to stay as far away from that as I can. And it's definitely, Dara, a loaded give. So if I'm offering time, thinking there could be money at the end of that exchange, that will come through in my words, in my energy, all of it. So I want to make sure if that's helpful. Um, I, I, Claire Marie, I like that you're going to move off the island of people pleasing. I love that. Um, Dara, let me know if I handled that for you. Um, but don't we need to fe be, feel validated to know we're serving? So that's you, Pamela. Um, I need to understand that a little bit more. I don't need to be validated in serving. Like I don't need to have anybody. I, I want, that's like, I want to be in selfless service. So I don't need anybody to acknowledge it. If I'm going to serve someone, I mean, if they say to me, this was, I'll ask at the end of a call, was this helpful, right? Now people are polite. Maybe it wasn't. And they'll be like, oh, it was so helpful, Carolyn. I'll like, great. And I walk off thinking I helped someone. Doesn't always mean it's accurate because people are being polite and people pleasing. Just know you're not the only one on the people pleasing island. Those people that we're connecting with and inviting are also on the people pleasing island, probably more than you are. So they're gonna they're gonna want to say sometimes what we want to hear. We're attempting to get rid of that, right? Part of our job as a coach is like I want people to be straight with me, and I'm gonna be straight with you, right? I'm gonna be willing to share the truth as I see it. So one other clue when you're on the island of people pleasing is you are not saying what you are thinking. So if I'm sitting with someone. And they are sharing with me about a conversation they had at work. And I'm aware that I'm thinking, wow, that was really aggressive what you said to that person. And I don't say it. 
I have to ask myself, why aren't I saying it? Now, sometimes I might not say it because I'm like, mm, I got to think about how I'm going to say it because I don't want to, I don't want to say it in a way that might land as too much for them. But I, if I'm in the land of, they might not like it. They may not like that I say that. I'm on the people pleasing island. That's where I am. So I want to come up with a way to go, okay, can I pause you? You said something a little earlier that I noticed. You said that you, you said to someone in your meeting that it was your turn to be the one leading the meeting and that it was your turn and you wanted it. Am I, did I get that right? Is those the words you used? And I want to be really neutral. And they go, yeah. I was like, it's my turn. And I said, so can I offer you something? Yeah. Oh, go ahead. Okay. And you might not, it might feel uncomfortable. No, no, go ahead, Carolyn. So when you said that, that felt pretty strong to me in a way that I wonder how it landed for your colleague. Because if someone came at me with, it's my turn, I might be like, are we... Are we on the dodgeball field at school? Like it feels a little like there's like territorial stuff going on. Could that be possible? So if you're not saying what you're seeing, it's highly likely you're not serving. That's not serving. And you're on the people pleasing island. Um, I'm reading you, Michelle. I practiced low attachment today with a final session with a client at one pricing, having coached for two years, and she wants to re-enroll but is hesitant for finances. Um, I feel I'm serving her by slowing down, showing her she's resourceful, and can choose to further invest in herself if she wants. I think that's great, right? And I want to say something to you, Michelle, and, and this is, it may sound like in conflict with this. See, if I know that someone is going to be better off continuing to coach with me, I still want to, I still want to be in their world, right? Like I'm not going to rush them. I'm not going to be like, I'm like, hey, take all the time you need. And I want you to know we have more to do together. We have more to do together. So I completely know that you are resourceful, wildly resourceful. And even if I don't ever see you again, I want to make sure you know you're resourceful and we have more to do. We have more to do together. So I want to take a stand for the work that I'm doing with someone if I know it would really benefit them to continue. And if I'm not sure, I'm like, I don't care. Like, I'm okay if they don't work with me again. Or I really feel like we're done. We want to be done. I know coaches who take continue to like re-enroll when the truth is maybe there's not real deep coaching occurring, but it's gotten comfortable. And we want to be on the lookout for that because being comfortable is not serving. Um, Carolyn, along the lines of going slow, what if the prospect doesn't get back to you? How do you decide if this person is interested or not? Great question. Um, I, I don't know. I, I'm going to mess up your name. I want to say that. And I apologize. I think it's Kin. I think it's Kin. So if I'm screwing it up, I, I'm so sorry. Like this is where Facebook lives get weird because I can't have you coach me on how do I say your name? But I wanna know, and this is a yes or no question, do you know about the question mark email? And if anyone else doesn't know about the question mark email, say, I don't know. Um, I'm gonna pause you for a moment. Yeah, Johnny, I see that. So I want you to know that, um, Melissa, we're gonna get to your question. Um, So the question mark email, for anyone here who doesn't know what it is, if someone doesn't respond, if a prospect doesn't respond and I'm sending them something, oh, Chin, Chin, thank you. I love that. That was so helpful. Thank you for helping me. Um, Chin, uh, if you don't know about the question mark email, if someone doesn't respond in, you know, two to four days, you're going to resend the email. You're going to strip out the subject line. You're going to put a question mark in the subject line, only a question mark. And above the prior email, you're just going to be really innocent. And you're going to go, hey, did you get this? I haven't heard back from you. Super simple. Did you get this? I didn't hear back from you. We want to assume innocence. People are being inundated with emails, with texts, with stuff in the news, with fears, kids, job stuff. We don't want to be like, why, 
they haven't responded yet. What's wrong with them? Didn't they see my email? I love it, by the way, if I don't respond to someone and they resend it and they're like, just bumping this up to the top of your emails. I'm like, okay, that works for me. They know that it went down in my list. So we want to be innocent and be like, did you get this? Um, Melissa, your question is related. So I'm going to answer it. Um, and the question was, is it okay? I want to make sure I've got it. Oh, Kirk Souter is here. He's the originator. He is the original question mark guy who, who taught me it. Um, Kirk Souter is a fabulous coach. He has been in the CFJ Coaching Success School, and I worked for him for a very brief period of time. He, is, he was a very uh, highly impactful uh, advertising leader in the world of advertising. He was a leader in the world of advertising and marketing, and I worked for him briefly, and he sent me the question mark, and I almost passed out because at that moment, he was my boss, and I was like, what did I do wrong? It literally put me in a panic attack. You could tell that I had more inner work to do about my own relationship to authority and bosses and things of that nature. And I was like, I called him on the phone. I was like, what, 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 what? And he was like, I just wanted to check on something. And I was like, D don't ever, that question mark was so disturbing. And he started laughing. He's like, we use it all the time in advertising. It is a 99% success rate that someone will answer you. They will answer you. So if you don't have the question mark in your toolkit, get it now. So the question mark, um, is it okay that I send it after that we've not yet agreed? Melissa, my question for you is, um, what was the last email that they didn't respond to? So you've had two gifted coaching sessions. It looks like you haven't agreed yet to work together. What's outstanding? What's the email that they're not responding to? Um, Okay, so Amrita and Dara, you'll let me know um, if I handled the question mark strategy. It's not really a strategy, it's a tool and it's innocent. And really the purpose of it is we're gonna be innocent with people because we don't wanna be sitting at home in the island of taking things personally. Like there's a whole island theme today. So I'm on the island of taking things personally. They haven't responded to me. It's about me, I did something wrong that's not being of service. We are self-focused. We are in our own, you know, echo chamber of me, 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 me. What did I do wrong? Why don't they like me? That's an island. That's another island. And we want to be like, wait, people get tons of emails every day. Maybe they didn't see it. And I'm going to be of service and say, hey, did you get this? Hey, I didn't hear back from you. Now, if they don't respond again, I usually do one more time. I'm like, look, I'm not a stalker. It's totally fine if you don't want to proceed on a next conversation. You can say so. It's all good. And I'm just making sure, especially right now in the summer, people have been away. Um, you know, I mean, I had emails that I didn't respond to when I was in Maine because I was in vacation and service mode to a family member. Um, uh, getting off the island. I love that. Um, there was another one. Oh, uh, Linda. Can being of service, can being direct and challenging be considered of service? Well, I'm going to ask all of you that. If I'm direct with you about your area of opportunity, so some of you have spent much time with me in the CFJ Coaching Success School, and I have been very direct with you about um, an area of opportunity in your enrollment, whether you're in, you're in hiding, right? You're hiding and you're not showing up, or whether you're coming in too hot, was it helpful? Was that of service to you? Was that of service? And if your answer is um, no, let's talk privately um, and I will give you some time. But most of the time, my experience of that, Linda, is if I'm, see, when I'm direct and I'm potentially going to challenge someone um, is it's always, the intention is always love. So underneath it is love. Like my intention is to serve people and to be a stand for love in the world. So if I'm being direct, there's also a high likelihood I might be the only person who is willing to say to you what I'm about to say. That's one of the best things about this profession that we can do for people. I mean, I can't tell you how many times Steve said to me, if you don't say that to that person, who will? Who else in their world is going to tell them this? 
because all those other people have agendas and all those other people are in people pleasing islands or they're in like, you know, you like you owe me, they're on the you owe me island. So they're not saying it or they're in on the resentful island. Like I resent you, but I'm not going to tell you my truth, right? We as coaches, we're here to serve people and to say the truth as we see it, not as the truth, but as like, if this is in service to you, I'd like to offer you something. Um, one, see, look, your directness was a beautiful service to my growth. Look at that. All those people, hundred percent in service. I once had to say to a coach and I say had to, cause it was really so compelling. I was in a class with them and literally inside of me, I kept getting, you have to tell them they're talking too much for people that they are talking way too much. And I, as a facilitator, it's like, my intention is always to deliver what I'm going to say with love. And I thought, oh God. And I knew, I'm like, this person is not going to take this well. Like I knew it was going to land. No matter how gentle I was, it was going to be tough. But I, inside, I was, the, the voice was like, you have to say it. And I was like, okay, I'm doing this. And I said, look, I want to share something with you. And it's probably going to be really uncomfortable. I want to give you a heads up. And he said, oh, okay. And I could see like the fear in his eyes. And I said to him, um, you talk more than people want to listen. That went in, it was that, it was like, it, and I knew, and he looked really, it looked hard, you know? I do not regret saying it. I do not regret it. Now, what he did with it, I can't control. I knew that my job was like, I'm not leaving anything on the table when I'm coaching someone. Right. If I'm only going to get one shot at it, I'm not leaving anything on the table. I don't want to walk away from a call and be like, I didn't say that. I didn't say that. And that could have been the thing that moved the needle for them. Right. So part of the job of a professional coach is to really look at, am I saying what I see? Now, there is there is a learning of how to say it with care and consideration. But direct can be caring and considerate. Right. I got, I love that um, Eric said a chainsaw to the face can be helpful. Now I appreciate that Eric. And you know, I don't know if I want my nickname to be the chainsaw. All right. Um, Devin Bandison, someone who teaches at my school and he's a good friend recently. Um, I was with him and he has a new name. Um, and he has agreed to this name. He loves it. It was given to him by my husband. It's, he's called, he's now the Black Stallion. Um, he hasn't decided if he's the Black Stallion of coaching. It had to do with some equine coaching we did together. He's the Black Stallion. I don't know if I'd want him calling me the chainsaw of coaching. Although it's funny. I will grant you that, Eric. It is funny. Um, and for some people, Diana, it does take a chainsaw, right? You know, but I would have to say to you, see, there's a distinction between a chainsaw for the sake of being a chainsaw and a chainsaw with love, right? It's like, I want to, everything I deliver, I want to deliver with love. And I'm always forecasting. So Linda, when we're new to this, when we're new to being direct, we can forecast like, hey, I'm going to say something. It may be uncomfortable. Do I have your permission? You can forecast. You can say, I'm going to share what I see. This might not land for you at all. So I'll give them an out. I'll be like, this might not land for you at all. And I'm just going to say what I see, right? It's been very rare that I've had someone be like, like get angry or offended because I've asked permission. That really helps. And I want to walk off every call that I'm on knowing that I did everything I could to serve that person. And I don't want to ignore my own inner knowing, right? Some of our job in our growth as coaches is to um, start to hone in on that, to get really good at hearing our inner guidance and then speaking it, learning how to speak it, learning how to speak it in a way that's got some grace to it, that has some, um, has some, has some love in it. Derek Bandison, uh, Derek, Devin Bandison is a super direct guy, right? I work with him a lot. We're great friends. He's super direct. There's no question that he is loving. Now, for some people, his directness can feel like a lot, right? And I know his intention. 
So I don't have any questions inside, right? So I offer to all of you, it's like, get clear on when you're in a call with someone or in a conversation, what do I need to say to have been truly of full service? No holding back. No holding back. If I was not holding back, what would be the thing I would say that could be of the most service to this person? And it still doesn't mean they're going to hire you. Like it can't be because then they'll hire me because I'm so, I was so honest with them, right? It's like, no, nope, I just don't want to walk away from a call knowing I didn't, I didn't give them my all. Oh, so Diana, that's a great question. Um, oh, well, it's a great, Diana, um, who was in the class last year and she's coming back, I'm so excited. Um, she liked, we would sometimes say on a one to five, what kind of coaching do you want here? So one is like, let's say that's like, like a, that's like a baby step, right? One is like, and then a five is like full force, full fire hose of coaching, right? Now, sometimes when we're new to being coached, Saying a one or a two is where I'm at, totally reasonable, right? It's like getting coached, when we're new to getting coached, as a coach, sometimes it's like, I got to dip my toe in the water, right? Especially when we're coming into the profession of coaching from another profession. Um, I'm thinking of someone who's coming back to the school, a fantastic coach, Farnaz. And Farnaz came to the profession of coaching from the world of being a professor of academics. And she was a very, she's super skilled as a professor, had been doing it a while. She walks into the CFJ Coaching Success School and she's putting her emails up on the Facebook page and she's getting a lot of coaching. Like there's a lot of people pleasing in this. This email is really about you. It's not about them. I mean, very direct feedback on her writing and her communicating. And initially it was a lot for her. She was like, whoa. I can't believe I'm sitting here being told, I don't know what I'm doing when I write to people, when I write to people all the time as a professor. And we had to really slow it down and go, let's go back to when you were first a professor. What was that like? And she was like, oh my God, I didn't know what I was doing. I had no idea. I didn't know how to write to students. I didn't know how to tell them, guess what? You're not passing this class. Yeah. So, the profession of coaching, it's built in. If you're going to be a coach and learn how to enroll and learn how to grow your business well, being willing to get coached on your communications, on the way you're in conversation. I mean, game film, for those of you that don't know, game film is a term originated by Steve Chandler. Obviously, it was originated before him in the world of sports. Football, they run game film, they slow down the video, and they go, all right, quarterback, here's what you did. All right, defensive lineman, let's slow this down. Do you see where you put your foot? So we do that all the time with coaches, right? Lots of coaches do this with coaches. Having game film run on a conversation that you had and going, let's stop right there. What made you say that? And they go, uh... Because I, I, I really was hoping they'd say yes to working with me. And I'll say, that was about you. Can you see that? Like that question statement you just made to that person in that conversation, that was about you. And they go. And it's so valuable. Not always comfortable, but so valuable. So listen, we have, let's see, Johnny, we have like almost seven more minutes. So I want to take any other outstanding questions about service, but I want to say what are what we have for you. And this is what you need to do if you want it. So this is a brand new handout. It's a brand new handout for coaches. And it's a handout that newer coaches can use and more seasoned coaches can use. It is specifically about the number of conversations you are in. That's what it's about. It's about how many conversations are you having. And it provides guidelines on if you want to be growing your business effectively, how many conversations ideally would you be in every week and every month? And, you, and there's a way for you to do your own test and analyze what you're up to using your calendar. So you can, you can check what you're doing and you can see where do I fall in the gauge that I've provided. So not for the faint of heart because most of you, I'm guessing, are going to go, oh my gosh. I'm not having nearly the number of conversations I need to be to grow my business to where I want. So I'm forecasting 
If you want this handout, there are two ways to get it. You can email me if you have my email address. Some of you, I'm not gonna post it here, but if you don't, you can private message me or you can private message Johnny Roman on Facebook, right? So Johnny Roman is here. You can private message him or you can private message me and say, hey, I want the handout. And then I'm gonna ask you for your email and then we're gonna send it to you. So if you want it, you gotta write to us and ask for it. And I don't want you to just ask for it because you want it, like don't be, like I don't want a looky-loo. If you're going to ask for the handout, I want an agreement that you're gonna do it. You're gonna actually analyze your number of conversations. So can you give that me your word on that? Because it's not a comfortable process. For seasoned coaches, there's another set of questions you need to ask yourself on that handout, and they might be uncomfortable too. So Johnny Roman just said, that's me. So if you want the handout, either private message either of us on Facebook or email me and we will get it to you. And when you private message Johnny Roman or myself or you email me, give me your word like, hey, Carolyn, I want that handout that, that where I can analyze my number of conversations and I'm going to do it. I'm not just going to read it and go, oh, gosh, ugh, don't want to. Don't want it, la, 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 don't want to know. Pretty handout, pretty, don't want to do, don't like. If that's you and you know it, don't ask for the handout. It's fine. You don't, it's like, that's okay if you don't want to know yet. It's okay. All good. So if you want the handout, tell me you're willing to do the work or tell Johnny, okay? And Johnny was in the school for two years. He knows what it's like to, uh, have the flame turned up on him about like, what are you up to in your world? How many conversations are you having? So you're just know if you write to him, he completely understands. He's been there. Anything that you're walking through, Johnny has been there. He's, he's, he's had the discomfort. He's, he's had me pick apart his emails. He's done it all. So know that, um, Johnny is someone who is a fabulous coach. He's the director of the school, but he's a fabulous coach. And anything you've walked through, he's walked through more recently than I have, right? Like I have lots of great stories and Johnny's newer in his growth as a coach. So his memories, his uncomfortable memories about me picking apart his emails are way more recent. And he has lived to tell the story and he's now got a full practice. Um, he just did a retreat with his wife that was a first for them to lead a retreat together. His wife was a already a successful coach a little further down the path than him. He has he is definitely catching up to her. And um, they led a retreat to Peru together, which is something fabulous coaches can do. And they brought their toddler, a dream that they had always had. They brought their toddler and the people on the retreat loved it. Her presence added to the experience. So for those of you that are like, I, I can't, can I really use the things I love in my life and my coaching? The answer is yes, and it was of service. So their daughter's presence on that retreat was of service to all the participants because they got to touch in to that younger part of themselves. And her presence really brought that to life for them, right? Because we don't often remember what it's like to be completely wildly curious as a toddler where we're not judging ourselves and we're not making ourselves wrong. She was a living, breathing example of that. So um, one minute left, I'm walking through the uh, um, questions. Paula, I'll private message you about this um, Cooper Norcross form. I, I would like to know more about that. Um, Chin, thank you for being here. Claire Marie, uh, Linda, Barb, all of you. Eric, um, chainsaw to the face. I don't, I think that's our theme, right? Chainsaw to the face. Is that being of service? And your island, right? Are you on the island of people pleasing? Or in the, are you on the island of attachment? Or are you on the island of service with no get, right? With the get being put on another island, at least temporarily. So next week, I'm super excited. If those of you, Johnny didn't really realize this, every week, there's a song that goes with the show. Next week is I Will Survive. 
I'm a disco fan. So next week is I Will Survive. We're going to talk about surviving and thriving as a professional coach. So same time next week. Be here. Tell your friends. Love to serve you. It's a big joy for me to serve you and to be with you. Have a great day, people.